Bonsoir à tous. Uh, welcome at the Alliance Française. So for those who don't know the Alliance Française, um, I'm uh, Emilie Georgine, the director, and we are both a place to learn French for kids and overall for adults, and also a cultural center. So as a cultural center, we like to promote all the diversity of the French-speaking cultures, obviously uh, European French-speaking cultures, Canada, but also Louisiana, of course. And uh, this is Creole Heritage Month, so we've been very lucky to have a talk last week with Tali Bogust and Lausanne uh, as a moderator. Uh, we also have some Creole classes and Creole table every Wednesday, every other week. And that's not just for October uh, Creole Heritage Month, but all year long, so please come at the Alliance Française for the Creole table if you're interested in Creole language. Um, and we're very glad to have uh, you three present um, all the, the issues about how to talk about the Creole history with the example of your plantation. Um, you all have different experiences from the plantation and different roles that you, Joseph, is gonna, is gonna present just now. So thank you again uh, to all for being here tonight. <laughs> okay, we miss work. Um, just to let you know about the programming coming at the Alliance Française. So we will have a movie screening next week, a movie about French rap. So see, diversity of the French cultures, uh, French, French speaking cultures. And we will have a, a music night on October the 24th with musicians coming from Brittany in French. In France, and uh, at the beginning of November is our big festival, my French Book Fest, a festival of literature in French for kids. So please, if you have kids in French immersion schools, if you're interested in, in books for uh, friends and nephews and cousins, uh, come at the Alliance Française. We'll have a big book fair and also some readings, some workshops. It's a very broad programming. So we are about to start. If you want to get a drink and some free pudding, feel free to do so. And Joseph, the floor is all yours. Merci beaucoup, Emilie, pour uh, l'accueil. Uh, I'm Joseph Dunn, and I work uh, with these uh, great colleagues and friends, uh, Lawson Ota and uh, Kitty Morlas Shannon, at Laura Plantation. We have. Uh, as Emily mentioned, uh, different roles there. And I would like to thank Emily and also uh, Carla for the welcome this evening. Also, Lawson for suggesting that we do this talk during Creole Heritage Month about what we do at Laura Plantation. Uh, I do the PR marketing and also help out with the narrative that we talk with, or the, the tours that we give to the visitors. Uh, Katie is the uh, historian who is digging in archives and finding all of this information that we then have to contextualize for our visitors. And the Boston has worked with this for a very, very long time as well as a tour guide and also as a consultant helping us figure out some of these things about how to um, how to model the stories more from an Afro-descended experience, an Afro-descended perspective, and also the Creole language aspects because he is a linguist, Katie has her master's in history, and I've been associated with the Lara Plantation Project since 1996, off and on. I've left and gone back a couple of times, uh, Katrina, other job opportunities, but there's something, it's just kind of like a bad drug that they will have, <laughs> all, the, all the stories that we have there, uh, and it's, it's a fascinating place to be, it's a fascinating place to work, and we get to do that every day. Um, before we get started with the discussion, and we do have some slides that are going to prompt some of the conversation, I do want this really to be an organic conversation with us. Uh, Katie sent me a text yesterday, she was like, Joseph, what am I talking about? I said, Katie, we can do this in our sleep upside down. Um, so we'll just, we'll just talk about what we do there and then have a question and answer period afterwards. So thank you all for being here tonight. Carla, can we play that video right quick? Um, and then we'll go into the discussion. Mm -hmm. Mississippi, Native Americans, French colonists, enslaved Africans, a feudal society of sugarcane planters. On one farm, four generations of one Louisiana family, both free and enslaved, lived, worked, and died. Here is a tale, centuries in the making, and one Creole woman, Laura Local Gore, recounts it all. Only one hour from New Orleans, Laura, a Creole plantation, brings this untold history back to life. It is every great river. 
That's kind of the base for what we do at Laura. And back in 2016, we put together a series of three small commercials like that that you can see on YouTube. And one of them is The Great River Deserves a Great Story. The other is Through the Eyes of a Creole that talks more about the role of women on the property. And the last of the three is called The Faces of Slavery, where we uh, do a little bit more focus on the enslaved population there. And we did those not only in English, but also uh, in French. And uh, if you can pull that down, I think we'll now pop to the, back to the regular. And I do promise I'm gonna let Lawson and Katie talk. Um, <laughs> so back at the very beginning of the project, uh, when Laura Plantation was first opened to the public back in 1994, uh, the main theme was where Louisiana is a world apart. And from the very beginning, that has been the focus of showing this is not really the American South. Louisiana is a very different place from the rest of the country. And I do have to recognize uh, Sand Marmion, who's here this evening, who with her uh, late husband, Norman Marmion, founded this project and got it started back in 1993, opened to public in 1994. And it was uh, really through Norman's work as the president of the uh, German Acadian Coast Historical Society and Genealogical Society, and his work as a historian out on the river, that uh, he knew that something had happened out in St. James Parish, and we'll get to that in just a moment, uh, which was very, very significant. Before Laura's memoirs were found, there were, um, so there was something that happened back in the 19th century with Oops, I turned it off. I'm not very good at this. Where's the thing? How do I make this advance? Which one is it? There we go. Um, so anyway, um, and so back in the 19th century, Alcé Fauché, you might have heard of Alcé Fauché High School, was going around and he was collecting folk tales. And these folk tales are Confer Lapin and Confer Boupin, we'll get to that in just a second. One of the things that I, um, I'm interested in, in chatting with you guys about in the very beginning is this idea of Louisiana exceptionality and New Orleans exceptionality and some historians and some uh, culturalists go back and forth about that. Is Louisiana an exceptional place and why? Why is it a world apart? Oh, you can try this one. Oh, that one works now? No. It's a boat and isn't it? Okay. Can you, okay, I don't know. Can you hear me? Okay. So you can look at Laura and see Laura as a microcosm of Creole culture and, and see how it's exceptional in that. So we think about the Civil War and we think of two very definitive sides, right? And the sides we think of are the Union North and, and the Confederacy, the South. But Louisiana existed in um, a, a tripartite caste system. And um, the argument that Isabel Wilkerson makes in her book, Cast, is that our country is based on a two-part caste system, right? Black and white. Well, this was different here because we had three, because enslaved people were considered Creole, because Creole was not a racial designation, it was a cultural designation based also on language and religion. So at Laura, we had that going on, and um, one of the most famous uh, Creoles of the time, his name was Francis Dumas, he was Francois, and then he, when he joined the Union Army, became Francis. And he was a major in the Union Army, and he was part of the second Louisiana Native Guard, which was a Union um, regiment made up of free men of color from New Orleans who were French speaking and Creoles, and they were in fact the ones who liberated the enslaved population at Laura and in the river parishes. So Flaji Dupar, who was the owner, one of the owners of Laura at the time, he is at the plantation. He remains while other people evacuated and Colonel, um, Colonel Nathan Daniels and his assistant Major Francis Duma, who is a Creole, he comes in and they have a conversation. And Flaji Dupar says to him, I just can't believe that you took up arms against your, your own people. 
Because in Flage du Parc, Somalia, yes, there was a racial divide. This, we're not going to pretend that there was equality here going on between free men of color and a white aristocratic plantation owner. But there was a cultural heritage that they shared. And he said, you are a Creole. How could you take up arms against other Creoles, against your culture? So I think that's a conversation that was happening here in Louisiana that you would not have found anywhere else in the South at the time. And then you had men, enslaved men, joining the Union Army who spoke French, who were being told orders by people in English. They couldn't understand what was being said to them. They were enlisting and their names were being changed. And later in life, when they were deserving of a pension from the federal government for their service, they couldn't even communicate with the people who came to talk to them because they spoke a different language. And I think we could, anyone here who comes from a Creole family or a French-speaking Louisiana family knows that we were stigmatized and made to feel like second-class citizens um, a lot of the time. And they also experienced that. So this was my Cajun grandma, who was actually Creole, but that's a whole other thing. Experience <laughs> that, right? So she experienced that in, in the late early 1940s when she started school, but these enslaved men of color also experienced that. So I think that while there are many things that about Louisiana that are in, are representative of the South in general in terms, unfortunately, of, of racial issues and economic disparities, there is an exceptional situation going on here in Louisiana. Possibly. Oh, sorry. Well, um, <clears throat> briefly, I'll say that I grew up in Monroe, Louisiana, uh, born of a mother who was born in New Orleans. And so, you know, it took me leaving the Deep South to really understand my heritage a little bit more. But I just thought I was Southern, you know, I did things the way I did because I'm Southern. And I started to realize that probably Macon and, you know, uh, gumbo and uh, you know midnight mass, even though you're not Catholic, you know, <laughs> it's not a southern thing. It's a Louisiana thing. And uh, what I appreciate about Laura is that that question mark that surrounded my youth, or you know, I'm still young, but you know, <laughs> my, my my younger days, um, it was answered. The question was answered at Laura because the word is Creole, and everything made sense once I understood that identity. And once I understood um, the, the culture associated uh, with it and how the term developed over time. So um, I'm appreciative to, to Laura for that. And I do think that Louisiana is very much so the American South, but it is very much so the northern uh, most part of the Caribbean. And we mm -hmm. can't forget that. That's a great point. Thank you for those answers. So we mentioned this idea of, of Creole. And one of the things that I'd like to say is before Louisiana became Cajun, Louisiana was called the Creole state, and we have tended over the last 30, 40 years to have forgotten lots of things about what that word meant, how these definitions were used, and if anybody in the room has ever been to New York and you've gone into Chinatown, for example, you cross a street and suddenly you're in a place that's no longer the United States. You're seeing all the signage in Chinese, all the vegetables are different, and that was the case here once upon a time when you crossed Canal Street, you went into the Vieux Carré, and then everything was French. Uh, we don't have these reference points anymore for there once upon a time having been three municipalities in New Orleans where two of them were French speaking, where everything, the commerce, the judicial system, the police force, uh, the families, the school system, everything was in French, and then you crossed Canal Street coming upriver, and then everything was in English. Those reference points have been lost, and with these um, images here, I've sort of made one up there in the corner where you can see the two uh, French municipalities, the Francophone municipalities, were downriver, and the uh, English municipality was upriver. This is sort of an illustration of what Creole Louisiana was, where people were calling themselves Creole. This is from La Bay, which was the French language newspaper published in New Orleans until around 1922, 1925. I, there are different dates that go around about when it last published. But you'll see down here at the bottom, it says, Dans toutes les paroisses créoles. So that's all of that area over there that since 1971 has been called Acadiana, 
But that was once upon a time called les paroisses créoles, just simply meaning that that's where the French-speaking people were. And then we see from the 1960s this uh, souvenir plate that calls Louisiana the Creole state. So uh, even though there is today lots of, I would say, confusion and even controversy about what this term Creole means, if we go back and look at these kinds of reference points, the French language documents and these ideas about identity and language and all of that, Creole once at a time just simply meant French speaking Catholic in Louisiana. And it, this identity was in opposition in many ways to American English speaking Protestant identity. We don't have these reference points anymore because nobody is really speaking French in their everyday lives, consuming lives, consuming services, and things like that. So I did want to bring that point up. Did you guys have anything you want to say about these these images here? How what did these images evoke for you? Well, having seen the images and then having just heard you, what came to my mind was the fact that um, in French there are no barriers. So the racial barriers that maybe keep me from sitting at a table with a, a Homa Indian person or for, you know, with someone who is Cajun identifying from Lafayette, those barriers exist um, even today, whether people want to admit them or not. But in French there are no barriers. I find um, people embrace me in a way that they wouldn't if I were speaking English. And I just think it's so interesting, but that, that's what united us at once upon a time, that common identity Creole was based on common linguistic roots and, and ties and um, it's something that is lost. And so with the loss of the language is the loss of the unity um, amongst formerly Francophone Catholic people in South Louisiana. I, I think it's also interesting to see how many people don't realize how common the word Creole was. I mean, it was just constantly used in Louisiana. Um, and it, and cows. Yeah, and yeah, it described products, it described food, it described people. And if you look at even the earliest um, enslaved inventories, they're describing them as Creole, meaning they were born here in the colony. And originally that's what it meant, born in the colony and it does share cultural heritage. Um, another thing that I've been thinking about recently is the difference between, because Joseph talks all the time about language, and that is a huge component, but the religious aspect of it, the Catholicism versus the Protestantism. And, you know, Protestants have this very much individualistic, I have a personal relationship with Jesus thing going on, right? Which is good, I mean, we all need that, right? right? Like, we need that, but I think, not to be offensive, we all need that, but I think Catholics have a more communal kind of um, association, um, and they see it as you know not a, um, salvation not just through faith but through acts. And so you look at these early Creoles who are benefactors of so many philanthropic orphanages, hospitals, um, schools, particularly in with free people of color in the city. So um, I think that's another aspect that we, we've kind of lost a little bit of, um, of uh, focus on, particularly like Mother Aria de Leo. And it all goes back to identity because you have people praying on Sunday, her, her prayer, and, and but they're saying Henriette de Lisle, and, and she wouldn't know who that was. <laughs> she would be shocked. And so I think if we're going to pray to her, we need to say her name right, first of all, so we know who she is. And that all goes back to this divide that we suddenly had about we're not Creole anymore, we're Cajun, or we're, you know, we, we, we lost track of some things, if that makes sense. <laughs> And here at the Alliance Francaise, you can learn how to say Henriette de Lille correctly. <laughs> a little plug for the Alliance. There go. So, one of the very first things that our visitors notice when they walk up to start the tour at Laura is that this does not look like a plantation house to them. Because plantation houses are supposed to be neoclassical Greek revival, big white mansions with white columns. And this doesn't look like that. And 
this becomes our first introduction at Laura to this idea of Creole as something different from what they might perhaps think that it is. It's a very brightly colored house. It's raised up off the ground. And this is what most of the houses along the river in Louisiana looked like up until the 1820s, the 1830s or so. And then you start to see hybrid uh, kinds of architecture happening. Uh, did you guys want to say anything about this image or do you want to move on to the next? All right, there we go. All right. Um, so, as I was saying earlier, from the very beginning, the idea at Laura was to approach this through a storytelling approach. And again, even before the discovery of Laura's memoirs in 1993, uh, we have to look at why Laura was saved. This is what it looked like in 1993 when Sand and Norman sort of took possession of the site to begin the restorations. And if I'm not mistaken, Sam, didn't Tulane give you all like six months before it completely pancaked on itself? Yeah, it was pretty much at a point of no return. It had been uh, abandoned, it had been vacant for many years. And some of the tree limbs were putting a lot of pressure on the house. You know, there were critters living in the attic. Uh, I fell through the floor of the front porch once. <laughs> it had just brought it out. So yeah, it was it was almost demolition by neglect. Now the other thing, and we'll move on to this next slide. You have the big house in the front, but what you also don't see from the road or from looking at the big house is that this is actually a an, a pretty complete plantation complex. It's not just the main house; it's also everything that is behind it. So uh, you have the second uh, Maison de Reprise, which was built in 1829, basically is the dower house. Then you have carriage barns, and you have other dependency houses. And in the back, there are four slave cabins, which date to approximately to the 1840s or so. And as I mentioned earlier at the beginning of the talk, this is where uh, Alcée Fortier very possibly came and collected some of these stories of Comper Lapin. So, Sam's husband, Norman, had been the president of the German Acadian Historical Society. He spent lots of time on the river, and he was a historian, and he was also a puppeteer. He was doing children's shows and things like that, and he was using these stories as educational components in classrooms and in schools to teach Louisiana school children about this cultural heritage and this cultural legacy. And these are some very rare buildings, um, slave cabins are. Uh, there are different estimates about how many of them remain in the United States, but they are incredible artifacts because they would not have been considered really to be historically significant buildings throughout most of the 20th century. Many of them were torn down for the lumber, they were destroyed, um, and these are uh, very significant artifacts for telling the stories that we tell. And the first approach at Laura was to use these stories of Comper Lapin and Comper Bouki, which in the English-speaking world are called Brer Rabbit and Brer Fox, as the gateway into telling the story of Laura Plantation. And I just want to go, because Katie mentioned, and I'm not trying to dominate the conversation, I'm just trying to set this up so that we can get to what we're going to talk about. Katie mentioned earlier these inventories of enslaved people. And this is the first one, or the first page of the one from Laura that dates from 1808, when Guillaume Dupac, who was the French founder of the plantation, died. In this list are the first names of 17 children, women, and men. And as Katie mentioned, um, Creole, when you look at these, something means that they were born in Louisiana. It means that they did not come from somewhere else, they were not brought from somewhere else. But additionally, in this 1808 uh, inventory, are listed five African ethnicities. Kanga, Congo, Minon, Moko, and Kisi. And I'd like for you guys to break this down for us a little bit because Katie, I want you first to tell us a little about the inventory and then Lawson, give us the linguistic aspects of what's going on here and what's happening in those cabins. So these are early days on the plantation and along the river. You're not, this is not a massive plantation yet. This is not, they're not bringing in huge um, cash crops. This is them getting established. So it's a small, much smaller labor force than what you'll see down um, you know, in the 1840s and 1850s. And 
what it reflects also is how the African heritage is still very prevalent. You have African people there um, who are telling the stories that came from Senegal, are from the west coast of Africa. And you also see that the majority of the workers are um, field laborers. There are they, they're either field laborers or they're not, they're, they're handling a variety of tasks because there was not as much specialization when you had a smaller workforce. So people were doing multiple things. There were only a couple of domestic um, house enslaved servants. Uh, so this was not some kind of grandiose operation at this point. These were early days. And what I've seen along the river is in these early days of establishing the plantation system, the, um, the, the, the people who enslaved people, the white family, and then the enslaved had to kind of have a working relationship where they were, it, it was about survival, it was um, about trying to just make it day to day. So this is a very different dynamic and a very different system than what you're gonna see down the road. And it was also very personal because when you only have 17 people, it's very different than a workforce of 100 or more. So that's gonna impact the interactions they have to the enslaved with the Duparks and Lacoles, the Duparks at that point. So, I can go on and on about um, the linguistic uh, uh, just atmosphere we had at that time. But before you start, what I, would, I would just like for you guys to try to imagine, because we, we always talk about the French colony. And when we say the French colony today, our reference point for language is the way that people speak French now. And we think that that's what was happening here. But this is a Tower of Babel. <laughs> so, you know, this modest plantation home, you know, it's beautiful today, but it wasn't considered, you know, anything special back in the day. It was like a trailer next to a work site because they didn't have a lot of money in the beginning. They were basically just, they needed a shelter. And that's why these houses were torn down. And then in the 1850s, when you have the sugar barons and all of this, you have these grand ostentatious Greco Roman style houses being built in the place of these old plantation homes because they weren't considered special, but the size of the house kind of reflects uh, the intimacy between slaves and masters in the beginning. They were pioneers, they were in the wilderness, they had to survive together, they were, um, their lives were intertwined in a way that we don't think of when we think of slave and master, we think of this huge divide between the big house and the slave cabins, that was not the case in the beginning. And um, I want to say that the ethnicities listed uh, reflect skill. You list it on a registry next to the values of slaves because their value was determined by where they came from and what skills they had. From Africa, they came here with skills. So this is important because what's going on in Florida and the comments about um, slaves having learned something, having gained something from slavery, it's just erroneous. They came here with these skills and then they taught other slaves to do the things that they have been doing for millennia in Africa, so that's important. They are listed ethnicities. Um, there are listed ethnicities here because that reflected their value. Quickly, I'll say that this connection between slaves and masters early on in Louisiana was a really big puzzle for linguists because they were trying to figure out how Creole, Louisiana Creole language, even developed in Louisiana because um, we would think that a pigeon that would have existed between slave and master would have given way to French really quickly because there is a great connection between master and slave. They were exposed to French all the time. Why would Creole even persist in Louisiana? It persisted in Haiti because there was a huge divide between the 5% of masters and the 95% of Africans who continued to speak West African languages. So what uh, linguists believe is that um, enslaved people learn French really, really quickly, but they continue to speak West African languages. When we talk about the Tower of Babel, these were many languages spoken in the slave cabins um, and in the shelters associated with slaves early on in Louisiana. They spoke West African languages in their families, but outside, they were interacting with Africans who didn't speak the same language. So in order to ease communication, they used French words with the West African uh, word order and structure and that facilitated communication between Africans, not between master mm -hmm. and slave. And Louisiana Creole developed amongst Africans attempting to communicate across linguistic barriers, not between master and slave here. And so um, this, this reality in Louisiana 
gave birth uh, really to, to Louisiana Creole, which developed in a different way than Haitian Creole and uh, the Creole of Guadalupe and Martinique. And you see that Louisiana Creole is also really close to French in a lot of ways because there was a 50-50 population split 51% African, 49% European from the very beginning of Louisiana as a, as a colony. So Creole has huge influences from French in a way that Haitian Creole was somewhat isolated from European French. And so hopefully that was understandable. That's fascinating. Thank you. <laughs> well, again, these are things that we really don't think about anymore. And then when we talk again about the French colony and we talk about the family in the house, so you have to also remember that into the second generation, so the founders of the plantation are speaking different varieties of French, because French is not yet the standardized language. Then you have all of the African languages thrown into the mix, and all these people have to communicate with each other. But who's bringing up the children? Mm -hmm. Who's bringing up the white children in the household? It's African women. It's Afro-descended women speaking Creole. So then within the second or the third generations, then the Creole language begins to dominate the French language. So you have white children growing up in these households who aren't going to start speaking normal to French until they're 10 or 12 years old when they get to school. So then what is happening, even though all of our historic documents are written in French as the normative language, so these people were mostly speaking Creole among themselves, but writing things in more normative French and speaking more normative French in certain kinds of social settings with certain social registers and things like that. And that's the thing that, that only really began to dawn on me about two or three years ago. I had been asked to do a transcription and a translation of the uh, 1811 slave revolt documents from St. Charles Parish, and it occurred to me that even though it's all written in French, the Africans, were, the freedom seekers, were speaking Creole, and the scribe sitting behind the table was obviously understanding everything they were saying because he was then writing it in French. So he was translating simultaneously as he was hearing and writing uh, the documents or the, the, the court records in French. So that's something I think we should always keep in mind now as we're looking at historic documents, what people were actually speaking, what they were writing, and how, as Lawson said, from the very beginning, the Afro-descended population and the white population were, you know, 51, 49, 49, 51. I mean, there were there were constantly half as many Africans here as there were Europeans. Did you guys want to add anything to that? Are you good? All right. Um, this brings us all the way back to Senegal, and there is a very famous man in the French-speaking world whose name is Léopold de Sédar Senghor. He was elected to the French Academy. He was a Normanian, which means that at the basis he was an educator. And uh, Senegal is a French colony. Uh, he wanted to sort of transition Senegal into a more French-speaking place. And he went around Senegal collecting these folk tales in the Wolof language, translated them into French, because children more easily learn new languages or absorb new languages or acquire new languages when they're familiar with the subject matter. And he published this textbook in 1953. In Louisiana, back in the 1870s, Alcé Forché was going around collecting the folk tales of Compère Lafin and Compère Rupi in Louisiana Creole. And when you do a comparison between Le Pelièvre and Louisiana folk tales, they're in many ways almost the same stories. All right. Uh, do you guys want to talk about this a little bit? Yeah. <laughs> so, some things we know for sure. Laura Lacoul Gore talks about. Alcé Forche in her memoirs, she talks about his grandfather, Val Perrin, who had a plantation very close by and is seen by some as like the quintessential Creole planter aristocrat and mythologized hugely. So to hearken back to what Joseph was saying about learning Creole prior to learning for, um, formal French, Val Perrin, the Val Perrin comes from his um, enslaved Creole nurse. That's what she called him. It was Gabriel, but that was the name she called him. Mm -hmm. He even writes about her 
in um, his journal about her death, uh, sickening and then her death. So you have this, this um, clear, I won't say love, but some kind of deep affection, intimacy, connection. And then you also have him writing very callously about other enslaved people having no real kind of connection or sympathy for them and their suffering. So there was this kind of a both and. And we know that Alcee Fortier was close to the family, that the, the Valper M and the M's were close to the family at Laura. They were connected, they socialized. And what we've discovered in many records is that the enslaved communities were in connected so the they married within each other they they were neighbors but they had they were family too so these stories were told all up and down the river and they were definitely told at Laura um, and I think that it's getting increasingly difficult with the, the younger generation to say this in a way that they understand because Br'er Rabbit and that folklore has kind of missed this this generation they don't it's not as recognizable to them so we are kind of trying to think of ways to convey this very important story still at our historic site where we we really i mean this is quintessential to creole this is an important thing to tell and to do so in a way that they'll find relatable now another real quick addendum to this is that um this is a classic example of erasure okay of, of denial of where these stories came from, who was telling these stories. If you look at Louisiana curriculum today, in third grade, they focus on Louisiana history. My, my daughter is now in fourth grade, but last year she came home, she told me all about their new unit. It was on the folk tales. They're Cajun folk tales, did you know that? Except they're not, and she knew it because she'd been to see Aunt Sand at Laura Plantation, and she'd been going there her whole life. So I had to answer this this question about, well, Mama, I thought that you know the African people were telling these stories, and that was the origin of it all. And I said, yes, it is. She said, then why is my teacher telling me that Cajun people originated these stories? And granted, yes. Cajun and Creole people were telling these stories too, but they did not originate with them. So I think. One of our jobs as Louisiana citizens, as, as people who are advocates for the speaking of French and for accurate history, is to, even if we don't have school age children, to recognize that this is the future of the French language, of, of French in Louisiana, and we need to get involved and make sure fallacies like this aren't being um, told to our children. Well, you know, I think it's interesting that, I mean, it is a part of Cajun culture in so much as right. Cajun culture is Creole culture. And I think we forget to what extent um, the ancestors did not live segregated lives. You know, the French Quarter was never segregated. The Fougal, Treme, the Marigny, you know, Bayou St. John neighborhood never you know, formally segregated. Um, and so they lived together and they influenced one another. And so, you know, 70 years ago, you might have just had French music, and now it's Cajun music in Zydeco, and, and, and near the Twain show, you know, meet. Um, but things were different um, uh, back in the day, and we forget uh, to what extent our lives were not segregated in Louisiana. There was a racial hierarchy always, but segregation was not a thing in uh, Creole Louisiana, just as it really wasn't a thing in Latin America either, um, not in the way that it was in the United States. Um, I will say about these, we do read these here at, uh, at Alliance in the Creole classes, and what's really interesting is that these stories are sometimes the same. Um, and they're the same, but the message is different. So in Africa, you have free people telling these stories. And so Luc Lugiel is um, a trickster, and maybe the message might be, don't be tricked, <laughs> right? Don't be tricked by the trickster. But in Louisiana, on fait la pain, is a trickster, mm -hmm. but the idea is do what you gotta do to survive. Mm -hmm. Because these are enslaved people telling these stories mm -hmm. here. And so the, the moral is very different, even though the story is the same. And we, we find that very interesting in the, in the classes. I see Ryan here as a, a Creole student. Mashira is here, a Creole student. So we have a few of our Alliance Creole students represented. But we have a really good time talking about these stories and what they mean. And sometimes the moral is elusive, but what's clear is that um, you know, people identify identify with Compa Latin 
um, his ability to trick others, but to survive, um, kind of represented enslaved people doing what they needed to do. They bought their own shoes. They make their own brooms. You know, they would work when they weren't in the fields for master. They were working in their own gardens, and there would be a salesman coming coming through, and he would buy things from them, and he would head on to New Orleans, and what we call the French market today, La Chal, uh, in the past, they would sell things made by slaves on plantations um, from New Orleans to Baton Rouge. And we kind of forget that they did a lot of things that they needed to do to get what they needed. But um, just to, to end on this, I'll say that um, in Louisiana we say, on fait beau qui fait gombo, on fait la fin manger lui. So, on fait beau qui, he makes the gumbo, but it's on fait la fin that eats it. And um, another thing that this makes me think about is that, you know, at, well, at every plantation you're going to find that they're all, everyone's interconnected. Family crosses the color line, that is very Creole, and was often recognized. So we see it at Lore, we see it at Valker Adams um, plantation, and one of the things that was unfortunate about Porsche is that he recognized the incredible importance of these stories but he did not recognize the importance of the people who told them. So when he rec records who told it to him, there he'll use a first name once or twice, um, sometimes an old Negro mm -hmm. in, Bashri, in the Bashri, okay? So they were, they were anonymous. There was kind of um, a dismissiveness and a condescension to that, this whole thing. So, you know, you can laud him for recording them, but then you can all you have to keep in mind that he was not very respectful of the people who were the culture bearers with this. Uh, he was also at the same time telling people that Creole was not color uh, anybody of color, and he gave a lecture saying Creole is white; it's descendants of the French and Spanish only. Anyone who says that Creole has anything do with, with black people or people of color is wrong. So he completely sold out half his family to be <laughs> biologically, genetically, to be honest. And this is very interesting in that um, just a few years earlier, his father's uncle testified in a case where a Forche of color was trying to get her property uh, and her rightful inheritance. And he said, this was my uncle's family. I would sit down at the table with them. They were my cousins. So he acknowledged that, but it was right on the cusp in the 1890s of that rejection. And Forche was someone who then rejected that old school Creole traditional way of seeing family and connections. Well, that, that also goes completely against the documents Correct. which we see, where, especially when we're talking about enslaved people, we see them categorized as Creole. So Correct. how could they not be Creole if they're recorded that way from the early colonial period? Yeah. Interesting. So uh, one of the projects that I'm actually working on at Laura is the creation of some panels that we will have up outside our gift shop that will be more representative of different aspects of the Creolite at Laura. And this is written in uh, Louisiana Creole, and this will eventually have a QR code that will take you to a website where you can listen to what it sounds like, you can read different things about it, and I'm doing that project uh, with the government of Quebec uh, through a company called DigiHub, and also with the Laura Center for Creole Heritage. So I uh, need to, you and I, I need to give you things that we can work on together because I can write the stuff in French, but he's more the expert in the Creole than I am. So um, that's going to be a lot of fun to do. And then we get to the discovery of Laura's memoirs in 1993. So Laura was a great granddaughter of the founders of the plantation. She had sold the, the plantation and left Louisiana in 1892 to move to St. Louis, Missouri, where her husband was from. And her memoirs, and over there on the your left is uh, a facsimile of the first page that she wrote in her very flowing 19th century script. And this then became the window into the Duparc and Wukou family. It's a first-hand account of life on the plantation, and that's a photograph of Laura there in the middle. And all of these people over on the other side are members of the family who were blood relations, both black and white, 
all of them in Creole, with some connection to this family. After the Civil War, Laura's cousins went back to France. And in the French National Archives in Paris, there's a whole dossier with information about the family, the daily operations of the farm. And since Jerry Honoré from the HNOC is here, it's actually the HNOC who helped us get that back in the early 1990s, uh, helped to get the digitized copies of all of that. So the, the original file is actually as the HNOC would have copies of it all. But that has been a huge window as well for us to talk about the larger picture of the French family. And Katie, hey, you did your master's work on the role of Creole women on plantations. So this is Laura's mother, Desiree. She was originally from Natchitoches. That's Laura over on the left. In the middle is a young woman named Susan. So we were talking about Louisiana exceptionality and are we really all that different? And with women, yes, <laughs> from the very beginning, because in the Anglo-American and the American colonies, they have practiced a common law system of primogenitor, so, and it was male dominant, men inherited, men owned property, firstborn male son gets more or gets the bulk of it. Uh, here in Louisiana with the civil law and forced heirship with successions, it was all divided equally between the children. So women from the very beginning inherited Women were allowed to own property. Women were not seen as their husband's property. Now, was everything perfect and ideal for women here? No, but it was dramatically different than in the rest of the South or the rest of America, which is deeply ironic considering that, you know, this is the stronghold of democracy and yet here we are in a more feudalistic system, but women had more rights. It, it just was the way it was. Um, so you see these women stepping up and taking on this matriarchal role. It's accepted, wholly accepted by people in society around them. And um, this, this was several generations of women, particularly Laura's grandmother, Elizabeth LaCoule, um, who ran the plantation um, just after the Civil War and really dealt with um, the difficulties that arose in terms of um, managing the plantation with free labor and um, figuring out ways to keep it afloat. Um, I think that there's also this misconception that women are gentler or more emotional or more connected <laughs> with people. Now this can be true, but I mean, we're all individuals and I'm here to tell you that slaveholding women were just as brutal as slaveholding men. Um, these women were tough, they protected their property, their property had happened to be enslaved, and they um, did things like had people branded for running away. They um, tried to circumvent legal um, laws that said that children under the age of 10 could not be sold apart from their mothers. Uh, they tried to circumvent that. They um, punished people in all kinds of um, brutal and horrible ways. So while we can celebrate the role of women here and that they were leaders and they had business acumen, we also need to keep in mind that it's complex, I think. This is more of a New Orleans thing, but I always think it's interesting how um, women of African descent were able to keep certain aspects of their culture here um, and how you know, necessity kind of made a space for women to have more rights in, in Louisiana. I mean, if you educated only one of your children, that was your oldest son, and the mortality rate was as high as it was, your family would lose its fortune really, really soon. You have to make sure that all of your kids were prepared. And, you know, at the time, they realized that women could do it. Um, and that that was their best job to take over. But also, you know, women marrying into um, other families with husbands 20 years older than them, I mean, the reality is that they were often widowed and having to, you know, hold things together. That's the reality. But for African women, I tell the story of Rose Nicole, who uh, sold coffee in New Orleans, and before Cafe Du Monde, Cafe Vigny, and all of this, she made it a, you know, a popular thing to drink coffee in the streets of New Orleans. Um, but she bought her own freedom uh, through her entrepreneurship. And so uh, I was telling the story to a Vigny Noir's woman on my tour, and she said, well, you know, Boston, that, that's like my mother. She had her day job and she was a housewife at one point, but whenever she needed a little extra money, she would go down to the market and sell things and do what she had to do. And these African women were continuing to do that in the new world. Bought 
their own freedom, oftentimes about the freedom of their children and their husbands. Um, and so uh, that's a beautiful aspect of <coughs> Creole culture. So you see women having a different role here as enslaved people, as free people, as plantation owners, mm -hmm. um, as enslaved women on plantations. I just think it's interesting. So the, the young woman in the middle, as we mentioned, is named Susan. Susan's father was an enslaved man whose name was Edouard. Edouard had been off to fight in the Civil War on the Northern Union side. He is one of the men that Katie mentioned earlier, for whom we have a Civil War pension record, uh, which is a very, very detailed account of his whole life. So if you are familiar with the slave narratives that were done in the 1930s with the WPA, those were elderly people who had been enslaved as children, but when we look at Civil War pension records, for example, they're much more detailed because they're coming uh, from the memories of men who were in their teens and their 20s when they went off to the war, so they're much more vivid. And they were basically extremely vetted uh, when they were trying to get these pensions. Just imagine elderly people who can't speak English being drilled by uh, English-speaking bureaucrats from Washington, D.C., and some of the pensions were denied because they could not properly pronounce a word or something like that. Uh, but I want to talk more about, um, about Susan's grandfather. Susan's grandfather, Edward's father. We're talking about three generations of enslaved people here. And I do want to point out that when we started doing tours at Laura Plantation back in 1994, we were really the first place to talk about slavery openly. Because through Laura's memoirs and through the documents that came back from France, we have very detailed accounts. And what's interesting about Laura's memoirs is that she wrote them when she was 75 years old. And almost everything that she writes checks out. Mm -hmm. It can be verified. And Lawson, you have a particular attachment to Susan's grandfather, who we call, uh, we call him Paul Philippe. And the, the the story of the, the griot as the, as the tradition bearer and the storyteller. And I would like for you to tell us in Creole what Pa Philippe said to Laura, and then I'll read it from the memoirs. No, just 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 say what he said to her. Okay. Um, so Laura asks him, uh, why do you have those scars? And he'll explain why the scars look there. But he said to her, uh, Laura, mouvier à terre. Mouvier à terre. Mais comme tu es jeune comme toi, ou tu es esclave ici, et motolé, moquin la liberté. Un jour, on t'échappé, l'habitation là, on t'es couru dans la cage, on t'es galopé. Et Monte Kuri dans bois où personne n'était pas capable de trouver moi. Mais ta grand-mère, il était voyé les hommes après moi, colombier, il était trouvé moi dans mon marécage. Il était trappé moi, il était mené moi ici, Laura, et dans le ça là, il était maqué moi avec un feu rouge. Il était maqué moi avec un feu rouge. So one day, Laura writes, as I stood on the top of the well where water was pumped into a long trough for the horses and cattle to drink, a weather-beaten old Negro named Pa Philippe, whose work it was to pump the water, was standing close to me. On his creased and wrinkled old face, I saw the letters VDP. I pointed my finger to his face and asked, oh, Pa Philippe, what is that mark on your forehead? He turned to me and laughed in a hard, cackling old voice, saying, Lord, child, don't you know this is where they branded me when I used to run away? So we actually have, through the research that Katie and Sand and others have done, we've discovered the runaway slave ads that have him listed from that plantation as a, as a runaway, as a freedom seeker. So this is a, a big puzzle, obviously, to put all these things together to verify, because you can have a first-hand account, but then going into archives to try to find the supporting documents that go along with that. And that's a lot of the work that you do, Katie. And then as we're pulling all of these historic documents together, pulling all of that down into, I say, kind of bite-sized pieces for our audience to bring them into this world so that they understand that these are 
personal first-hand accounts from, from people who were enslaved at Laura. Um, and you have, if I am recalling correctly, uh, been able to uncover no less than 400 first names of children, women, and men who at some point were removed through the property. Um, so there we have uh, a composite of Edouard, we also have a composite of Susan, and we have uh, a composite of Lucy. Do you want to tell us a little bit about Lucy? So when I referenced that um, Valparam had this complex relationship, right, with enslaved people, and that Nanette and Elizabeth had complex relationship. They could be brutally cruel, they could also be seemingly benevolent, right? This is one of those examples that's complicated. This is Lucy, and remarkably, she, um, her photograph, or her image, which we now have, was it was in France for years and years and years because the family, um, one whole side, moved to France and um, relocated permanently around the 1890s. Now, Lucy was in, born into slavery in Virginia. She was of a mixed racial background, and when she was about eight years old or so, she and her siblings and her mother were sold through the domestic slave trade down to New Orleans. And Raymond Lecou, who was Laura's grandfather, purchased them, brought them back to the plantation, and um, employed them forcibly as domestic servants. And um, remark uh, very tragically, he sold a couple of her siblings and her mother but they kept Lucy. And Lucy was assigned to Emma Lacool, who was Laura's aunt. They grew up together in this relationship in which they were intimately bound, and yet one clearly was um, favored, had um, rights and, uh, that the other did not have. So it was very, you can only imagine the psychological ramifications of that, like this, this relationship in which there's this intimacy, this bond, this closeness, they grew up together, and yet there's clearly a, a difference, a huge, vast difference too. And then when Lucy became an adult and M.A. married, she became the um, nurse, they called it a nurse, like a nanny, to M.A.'s children. And then um, Lucy lived out the remainder of her life in the uh, Lucoul's French Quarter home. She brought in her elderly mother and nursed her there. Uh, she was clearly someone that the Lacouls had some kind of rapport with, some kind of closeness. And at the same time as they were branding people and doing these hor horrific things, they were also somewhat sympathetic to Lucy, but Lucy probably always had to question their motives and live in a way that um, was was really traumatizing at the end of the day. Um, we know she and her husband actually earned enough money to buy uh, property in Carrollton. They owned a little house and she died here in the city. And the remarkable thing is that her husband, uh, he inherited from her. And then when he died, he passed it on to their nieces and nephews who were back home on the plantation and they then got mm -hmm. each one of them they sold it to a mortgage company they got nest eggs and they were able to have a little more funds to survive on and that's what you see at laura all the time these kinship networks that are formed of people supporting each other they supported each other and got themselves through slavery and they stuck together afterward as well so I just want to come back to something that Katie said earlier about when she was talking about the women and she was talking about the civil code and all of that. Um, would you agree, and please correct me if I'm wrong, in many ways, it, information about genealogy and those kinds of things is more accessible for Afro-descended people in Louisiana because of the civil code, the notorial archives, the Catholic Church archives. And we also have Jared Formation OC from, um, who's a, a genealogist. Do you agree with that? Is, is it more accessible for Afro-descended people in Louisiana for information than say the American South, for example? Absolutely, absolutely, because of the availability of um, the sacramental records which help to document their lives, 
um, just because of the, the, the sheer number of transactions that Kay and, and I and others have pursued in parish courthouses that document um, these communities, both enslaved and free, between census years, absolutely. And so these are the, the kinds of stories and the kinds of things that we're talking about at Laura when we have, have visitors coming through, how we set, we use the setting of the, of the plantation, the house, the slave cabins, and, and the grounds as this juxtaposition to what people think was happening on plantations, and oftentimes it sits way outside the box of the 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 idée reçu and the, the, the mythologies. Um, in 2017, we opened the uh, how do you call that in English? The exhibition um, from the big house to the quarters because there is so much information, and even now this is out of date because Katie's discovered more things. Um, we opened this in 2017 because it's impossible for us in the time that we have doing a tour to talk about all of the different aspects of this. And it's broken into different sections. So you can look at healthcare, you can look at the division of labor, you can look at what was happening during the Civil War. You learn that Fats Domino's parents uh, were from a, a piece of what had been Laura Plantation before they moved to New Orleans. And there's one room, uh, this room right here. You start in this corner, with the first acquisitions of enslaved people in 1787 in Pointe Coupe, because Laura's great grandfather, Guillaume Duparc, was the commandant at the post at Pointe Coupe. And then you wrap all the way around to the other end of the room, and that is just a tiny fraction of the uh, transactions of the buying and selling of, of human property that we have on display. But you have been able to develop and and, and curate entire biographies mm -hmm. for some of the people who were enslaved at Laura. Do you want to talk a little bit about how that work operates? Sure. So one of the things that I think was so important that Joseph pointed out is that, for example, Susan Grow, that's three generations of her family living at Laura Plantation. She died there. Her children continued to live there. We have, and, and granted, it's not for every single person enslaved there, but we have um, had remarkable success in finding multiple generations of people who lived at Laura, and we feel that this story is just as important, if not more so, than the four generations of Duparks and Lacools that lived there in the big house. You cannot tell one story and not tell the other. Um, for me, it's like talking shop, and I didn't know that this was fascinating to people until people started emailing me about it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so what Sam started with um, were the, the inventories of the enslaved that were taken. When someone died, then you have to have a division of property and you have to settle their estate. So they would um, write down everything they owned, and that include, uh, included human property, and so, those inventories, um, you, you're kind of almost cheering for someone to die because then you get them right. And, and we have a little bit of a gap from about 1829 to 1850, but for the most part, I think we have five or six inventories to go on and that allows you to trace people over time. So that's the first component. And then you factor in the bills of sale. So you can go to the notarial archives here in New Orleans, or you can go to the St. James Parish Courthouse, and you can find the, the sales of the enslaved people, and then you match them up to the people you have in the inventory based on name and age and other circumstances. And then you go to the Archdiocese of New Orleans or the Diocese of Baton Rouge archive. You go through the baptismal records, the, the funeral records, and, and those things. Then you find out who, you can trace whole families. You use then after the war, census records and things. So, so there's a process. It's a really lengthy, involved process and it requires an immersion into the whole community really, but we've done it. And I think that it's remarkable that we've done it, number one, and, and number two, that we're using it. Because if you go to any other plantation, they're gonna pick a couple of enslaved people there to kind of highlight. They're not gonna talk about the whole community because they're not doing that kind of research or work. Um, or they're going to talk about this vague, large mass of people, the, the, the slaves, right? 
in a non-specific way, which is not involving storytelling, which is what we do, which Joseph pointed out, and they do it using WPA narratives, which were taken up in Virginia, North Carolina. They're not talking about the Creole aspects. They're not talking about the people who actually lived and walked the, the fields and the grounds. It, you're not getting the same kind of experience as you would at Laura, and we even have decided we need to do better. We need, need to do more, and we're talking about creative ways to do it outside of a tour, because a tour is very limited. It's only a certain amount of time, so that's what we're, we're working on. Um, but it, I think it's really important to remember that the unique cultural heritage that is Louisiana, that is Creole, is only being told at Laura right now and that this is a very precious thing and do our best to be stewards of it. Did you want to add anything yes. to this bit, Wilson, or? Just that the stories um, enable us to add a nuance to the story of stories of enslaved people that um, is often elusive in other places. People do talk about them as, as a monolith, mm -hmm. and um, the, the nuance is important um, in telling these stories because no you know, two enslaved people have the same experiences um, and certainly, the slave people in Creole, Louisiana had different experiences than people in Georgia and Mississippi. Um, chattel slavery is chattel slavery, but there are differences, for sure. <laughs> um, we're getting close to the end. Of, uh, this is, uh, Lawson really likes Alfred Mercier, who was one of the writers. <laughs> and in 1883, he said, Le jour où on ne parle plus français en Louisiane, il n'y aura plus de Creole. So when French is no longer spoken in Louisiana, there will be no more Creoles. So how closely was the French or the Creole language tied to this identity? Well, after this, he certainly thought that it was, um, you know, it was the basis and foundation of Creole culture. It was what united us, Creole Louisiana, um, in the face of Americanization. What I love about Alfred Messier is that in his stories, and La Visitation saint is my favorite, um, really, book of all time, but um, certainly a Creole literature, everybody's represented. And, you know, he had his perspective. He was from a wealthy um, plantation owning family. Um, and so it's clear that certain perspectives are not, you know, well represented. But um, everybody's there. Native Americans are there, enslaved people. Um, on various levels of the, the ladder of, of the enslaved hierarchy are represented. Um, and these connections between um, enslaved members of the family and free members of the same family are delved into. But I just want to say that after Messier was different in that um, a lot of Creoles of European descent in the late 1800s had a choice to make. And the choice was between the, the maintaining of Creole culture, which would have meant them drawing closer to their Afro-Creole half-siblings and cousins and uh, relatives, or maintaining their socioeconomic status in the United States of America. This was becoming an American state. They had a choice to make, and they made the choice of maintaining their socioeconomic status as white people in the United States. And they dropped the Creole label shortly thereafter. They dropped the Creole language. And that is why Creole is oftentimes associated with people of African descent. It's not because black people have created agencies to give people licenses of, you know, Creole identity or not. You can be a Creole, you can't be a Creole. That's not how it works. <laughs> it's because white, wealthy Creoles who were in the state legislature, who had the power to fight against anti-Francophone sentiment, decided that it was more advantageous for them to be white Americans than it was for them to be Creole or Louisianians. <laughs> Sums it up. And that is the best summary I've ever heard of it. Yeah. But, and, and Guy Aure, Charles Guy Aure, the historian who stood up at Tulane and gave the lecture about what Creole is. It's not black, it's not people of color. Guess what, y'all? He had Creole, uh, he had children of color. He had children with an enslaved woman, and he was spouting this off. So just, you know, mm -hmm. keep that in mind. <laughs> what year was that? 1890, 90s. 1890s or so. Yeah. So since we opened the doors in 1994, we've been telling this Creole story, and it is constantly evolving. We are at this very moment working on what I think, if I count correctly, <laughs> is our 20th version of the script, because uh, our guests want 
always more and more and more information about the enslaved people. Um, we're uh, trying to figure out how to make that uh, make that work. One of the things that I, I would like to just in, in closing say is, uh, and Katie, Katie brought this up as well, we're becoming the front line for telling these kinds of stories because they very likely will be disappearing from curricula in schools. They will very likely be disappearing from curricula in schools. If we see the Comper Lapin stories being relabeled as Cajun to whiten them, if we're not talking about the complexity of Louisiana, we are really, really missing the boat on exploring and embracing the richness of, of this culture. This is, this is about Mardi Gras, it's about gumbo, it's about jazz, it's about all of those things that came out of this clash and blending of African and European and Native American influences that we, that we talk about uh, at Laura. And I know we've gone a little bit long on time, but I do, did want to give a couple of uh, minutes for, um, uh, for question and answer. If you want to find us on the web, uh, lauraplantation.com, or also on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, we do have a podcast. Uh, it's the Laura Plantation podcast, and I just did one last week with Dr. Angel Adams Parham, which uh, was really, really good. She is an African American scholar. Her specialty is the Haitian presence in New Orleans in the early 19th century. And we talked about a lot of things beyond just the, you know, just the Creole thing. We talked about uh, how you, how, how we, how we talk about urban slavery because that's not part of the tourism marketing team. We bear a lot of the responsibility, we got all of the responsibility for transparency about talking about slavery in plantations. The city is completely exonerated and exempted from it in many ways. Um, and that comes down to things like uh, lodging and weddings because people would get married in French border courtyards just surrounded by, surrounded by enslavement and never think twice about it. They will sleep in boutique hotels in the French Quarter and never imagine they're sleeping in what was a lodging for an enslaved person. They'll get married in St. Louis Cathedral and that was the largest institution of enslavement in Louisiana before the Civil War. And never associate any of those spaces with, with slavery. And I think uh, going forward, in the tourism community, in the cultural barrier community, we need to be really talking much more about how the global phenomenon of, of slavery actually exists here. So, um, did y'all want to give some closing comments right quick? I think that um, we don't fit in a box, we don't fit the historical narrative, we don't fit the accepted view. And it goes back to the caste system and the need to classify black and white, English and, and foreign, right? And, and what is American and what isn't American. And so we don't fit any of that. And we don't want to have a both and kind of culture. What we would want an either or. And we're seeing that all these issues, Joseph and I talk all the time about everything that we talk at Laura about at Laura is absolutely relevant today. You will find a modern equivalent of it or in a way that the history we talk about informs what's going on today. That's why we have to tell these stories and more and more we have to show as a nation that we are just, we are not an either or, we are both and, and we need to stop looking at things in this black and white dichotomy and see the nuance in each other in our communities. I agree, and um, I just want to say that my grandmother, who was born in 1929, um, knew enslaved people. She knew slaves. The elders of her community had been born as slaves. And you know, it makes sense if you were 70 years old, 80 years old in 1929, that's the reality of your life. Um, but what I love about Laura is that even though I had that old tradition in my family of you know my own family's enslavement or slavery in general, what Laura gave me was documented, you know, facts, dates, and all the things I always knew. I could say the Bumbara tribe brought this to Louisiana, and my grandmother didn't have that necessarily, or my mother didn't. But um, that's the beauty of Laura is um, the the well-researched 
and well-documented information that we share with um, the visitors. Um, it's, it's a fact-based uh, tour, and it gave me so so much of a foundation on which to stand in my truth, what I already knew, but it was documented, it was dated, it was you know everything that needed to be for it to be received by others um, in in the right way. So I'm so thankful to Laura. Do you guys have any questions? We would certainly be glad to to chat a bit. Yes. Uh, Rick Lawson mentioned that. <coughs> excuse me. No, um, the, this Creole may have developed in a sort of language prior to a sort of bridging between, uh, I'm sure, between um, standard uh, 18th century French or whatever that some people may, some of the owners may have spoken, and um, whatever dialects or whatever the, among, the, among the enslaved population. So I'm, I'm curious about, I, I noticed when you showed uh, uh, a historical document up there, the, the different spelling from standard French, where K's are used, where C's could have been used, and all that. So how much um, written, how much literature, and like literature to some extent, such as short stories or whatever, or maybe just letters, is there that's actually written in Creole, or did more literate people write, say, in French, but speak in Creole? Was there some kind of split like that, which does occur a lot in mm -hmm. sort of colonial situations? Mm -hmm. yeah, um, um, it's a well-documented language, going all the way back to the Spanish period. So um, Joseph was talking about how some of the scribes in the court rooms uh, wrote things in um, what Joseph would call normative French, right, the standardized, if we can use that word for that time period, um, mm -hmm. French or Spanish. Um, but uh, sometimes the scribes wrote it exactly as it was said, and it was said in Creole, and we have references to what we call Creole um, all the way back to the Spanish colonial period because they expected enslaved people to learn the language of the slaves, mm -hmm. and that was Creole. So all the way back then, we have documentation. Yeah, sparse, but it's there all the way back to the 1700s. In the 1800s, uh, we have a lot of usually white Creole authors writing down stories that they had grown up with um, as children raised by people of African descent. And so um, it's really in the um, late 1800s that you see all these stories like Compatta Fan being written down, uh, the poems of enslaved people written down by people like Jules Chopin, and um, you have Alfred Nassif, but a lot of Creole in L'Habitation Santiba. So if you get it in English or French, you can see Creole and it's translated into English or French uh, for you. So it's a good mm -hmm. book to, to read. And also Sidney La Houssey, a female author, mm -hmm. wrote a lot in Creole. So it's a well-documented language. They wrote it as a French person would write it though. And sometimes they wrote things that didn't need to be written differently than they would be normally written in French, but they wanted to say, this is Creole, this is black French. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't need to spell compass, C-O-M-P-A-I-R, you know, the, regular French way to spell it is pronounced the exact same way. The point of doing that is to say these are black people talking, this is not white people talking. So well-documented language, uh, for sure. It was the grammar affected uh, or influenced in any way by African languages? Absolutely. Um, it's hard to say how much because mm -hmm. some things that African languages do are just typical of world languages. Right. Um, and so we don't know if this is just something that's typical of how Creole languages develop or whether or not it's the African influence, but I'll say putting the determiner or the, for instance, um, the definite article at the end of the word mm -hmm. and not at the front. So um, la table would be the table, whereas la table would just be table. Mm -hmm. right? La table with the la at the end, that is the table, and that's a very West African thing. That's just one example. Sure. But um, that's also common in a lot of world languages, so is that African or is that just common? I like to think it's African. Sure. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, so through your research, you've been able to shine light uh, on the lives of many people who have been completely lost to this story. So that's really significant. My question is, um, you are studying before the Civil War and after. Mm -hmm. Is there a difference in what you can find as documentation? Since these people are not sold and purchased, so uh, is the Catholic Church then doing its job at recording birth? Uh, how, is it more difficult at the Civil War to trace the people, the enslaved population? It can be, but you also do have them now appearing in written documents with first yes. and last names 
um, beginning in the 1870s. And so the 1870s, 18, uh, 1870, 1880, and 1900 censuses are incredibly important to us. 1890 burned, so we don't have that, unfortunately. So that 1870 census is really important. And um, what we do see, at least um, in the countryside at Laura, is that as the decades progress after the Civil War, Catholicism for a lot of formerly enslaved people becomes something that, that they don't want to participate in anymore because it, they don't have their own autonomy. So they established Baptist churches, Protestant churches. It acted almost as like a communal, community center as well as a religious site. And then they were able to have some kind of place of power and recognition and um, their own autonomy. So in that regard, unfortunately, we do lose some a lot of records. But on the other hand, we do have legal documents with first and last names, which is, is huge. Um, <laughs> oh, and the other thing, real quick, about Creoles, they're going to have a totally different name in 1870 than they are in 1880, because first they're going to take their daddy's name as the last name, okay? So say their daddy was, was Jean, they're going to be Jean, but then they're going to find out, decide they want a totally different other surname, and they're going to get that or they're gonna become Johnson, son of John, an Americanized version. So with Creoles, the names can be very hard to track. It can be done, but don't say, oh, that's not that who that is, just because they have a different name. Because Creole names evolved, like the language. Hmm. Yeah. That's just one thing. Uh, the um, movement towards Protestantism mm -hmm. coincides also with the segregation of certain churches yes. as well. So people were disgusted by that. Yeah. You know. Um, and something about the Catholic Church, I don't want to go too far with this because it's just as it was an institution that kind of supported slavery mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, but there is a recognition of the humanity of enslaved people that you don't see in many Protestant denominations because everybody had the right uh, to Christian rights, baptism mm -hmm. and burial in holy ground and um, marriages, uh, you know, overseen by priests. And even if they, you know, didn't get a license mm -hmm. or even if, um, you know, it wasn't a ceremony in a church necessarily. Um, there was a recognition of their union in a way that you didn't see. You just jumped over the broom mm -hmm. in the Protestant, you know, um, areas of, of the United States. And so jumping the broom is still a thing for that reason. That was the only marker uh, between life as a single person and a married person. But uh, it was different in Louisiana because of the recognition of them as children of God. Yeah, and the Catholic Church was very integrated not equal, but integrated, until the Americanization, the black and the white, and the loss of that Creole heritage started um, coming up and beginning in the 1890s and then moving forward. And then I just wanted to come back. We do have Sidonie de la Vise and Alpha Mercier's writings in our library, so if anyone's ever interested, we also have some Creole literature, um, and we're about to add like 20 more books. So we all see if you can that. Thank you. Thank you for uh, for the great enlightenment, uh, Lawson. I heard you mention um, how much the fact-based research and the way things are done on documentation with documentation and, and, and thorough research at Laura, and how it helped you on your journey of self-actualization, finding who you are. Basically, you know, you found in those documents and those verifiable sources, you know, where you're from and, and how much it helped you. And I couldn't help but compare this to um, the story about Compère Lapin not being a Cajun, uh, not being a Cajun tale and, and being, you know, having some of those facts and documentation and verifiable facts that are, that are, that are being taken out of the curriculum. I'm just wondering, is there anything being done or what should be done to make sure that this um, erasement of the facts does not take over the curriculum, especially, you know, we start with youngins, but, you know, we're in all the way through the curriculum after eighth grade and after, you know, uh, being in high school where, you know, there's no more, um, um, that's what I'm looking for. Um, uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, immersion school, you know, being up to eighth grade and then after that, you know, it's it seems to me that the barrier for French speaking is going down 
slowly but surely, and, 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 and I think the fact-based uh, information education is very important to that. So what is, the, what, what is being done? What should be done? You know, how can we help? sure what can be done in, in public schools because of you know the divisions uh, what I do like about France and maybe it's a good thing or bad thing I, you know I don't know is that there's a national system and so Le Bac in you know Nice is Le Bac in uh, Poitiers in Bordeaux and there's a standard across the country um, and I think that would be difficult in the United States to put into place but each state controlling what the schools are able to teach, you know, is an issue uh, when it comes to um, certain political forces. Um, but um, I think we are seeing a fever before a, a healing moment in the same way that in the 1950s you saw a lot of craziness and then the civil rights movement come down. I think that's what we're seeing. So people's responses to what's going on in places like Florida is new content and, you know, videos on YouTube and, you know, movement starting and protesting and so, um, I think we will see, I'm hopeful today. Now tomorrow you ask me, I don't know. <laughs> um, I'm hopeful today, and um, so I think it's just gonna require people as private citizens doing more to get information out there, and this is the information age, and so I think there's hope, but I don't think it'll come on the, the level of what school boards are doing because it's different from state to state. We don't see in California the same thing going on in Louisiana, so. Thank you. And I might, I'm going to try not to be too controversial with this. I'm going to try to be diplomatic. I live in St. Tammany Parish, which is known as the bastion of conservatism in the home of David Duke. So it's just the truth. And my little children are in public school there, so I see firsthand what's going on. Who you elect matters. How you vote matters. People don't, I, I think we're only just now for some people realizing that. And some people who are one issue voters might need to reevaluate things because what's happening in Florida is coming here. It already is. All right. So you need to you need to not be afraid to speak up. And we see that in the civil rights movement, we see that with slavery, we see it in our history that people were afraid to speak up. People didn't want to stand up, people did not want to engage in controversy. But the bottom line is we have to or we're going to lose it all. There's a, there's a larger piece to this that unless you're doing the kind of work that we do and then also kind of keeping an eye on the curricula, a lot of people will miss. Visitation at historic sites in the United States generally is plummeting, generally. Um, there was an article in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago about declining visitation at Williamsburg and what Williamsburg is trying to do to, to curb that trend. There was an article in, I think it was the Washington Post, about the Guggenheim Museum and the kinds of things they're trying to put in place. So historic sites and cultural sites, museums, they're seeing declining visitation. I think that that is directly connected mm -hmm. to curricula because with the focus on STEM in K-16 curricula now, there isn't a focus on uh, humanities, a focus on the arts, or a focus on languages, which is very important for us here in Louisiana when we're talking about French and Creole, which is creating a complete and total disconnect to these kinds of places. And our challenge is that if we don't have visitors coming through the door, the work isn't being done and the stories aren't being told. Because we're not France and we're not Canada. We don't have a, a big pot of federal or state money that helps us do restoration projects, that helps us do research. It's all generated by visitation. And if people aren't coming through the door, the buildings fall down, the slave cabins aren't preserved, Katie's not in the archives doing the work, I'm not pushing social media stuff out and doing podcasts and uh, doing the, the kind of work that we do. And then the stories are literally not told. The stories disappear. So the sites disappear and the stories disappear. And I do believe that we, I was talking with my colleagues from Ogali Plantation and from St. Joseph and Felicity Plantations the other day. 
And they're, they're in the same dilemma, um, where how do we remain relevant to a visiting public? And we also have the added weight at plantations of the difficult history of slavery. And there are people now who are going to make the conscious decision not to visit the plantation because they're going to they think they're going to get their grandmother's hoop skirts and mint juleps tour, um, and they think that by paying admissions to a plantation is also further exploiting enslaved people. I'm going to come back to this, and this is going to sound a little bit controversial, in the fact that we do bear all of the weight of transparency for talking about slavery, but urban spaces are completely exempted and exonerated from it. If there were a plaque on every mm -hmm. building in this city where people were enslaved, it would blow your mind. Every built space in the city that exists before 1865 is directly connected to slavery. And I had that realization when I was walking around Paris one day because there are plaques on the sides of buildings that tell you this person was killed here because they were fighting for the resistance. And on some schools they have these big blue plaques that will tell you how many Jewish children were taken out of the schools and sent to the camps. We don't have any kind of physical representation or physical commemoration of the fact of what built spaces in this city are connected to slavery. And it, I, I think that it would blow your minds if you saw it actually represented. Not, not, to, not to mention the fact that New Orleans was the largest slave market in North America. So there were buildings intentionally just for housing enslaved people, selling enslaved people, incredibly dehumanizing, horrible things that we just walked by. And, and you know, we need to celebrate the architecture that we've saved and preserved, but we also need to recognize it's just as complicated as a plantation. Yes. I was just going to point out um, that the first slave revolt in the mm -hmm. colonies took place in New York City. Mm -hmm. And there, there have been recent finds in places like Brooklyn and Boston where they found uh, religious items from the slaves who were in were enslaved there in the 19th century. And, and it's, it's little known about the, because they didn't have the large plantation economy, just as the Upland South didn't have the huge plantation corvettes because they didn't have big farms. But uh, the slavery reparations movement is doing wonderful research on tracing exactly how much, say, Wall Street up how much Wall Street, things like the John Hancock Insurance Company, all of the major banks, they got very, very, very wealthy from uh, insuring and lending money to the huge plantation economy when the Louisiana was, because of the sugar you mentioned, was the richest state in the Union. There was a lot of money to be made from financing that and dealing with it. And this is something that is just totally erased in the North. You will never ever see any reference to it or anything unless you go into things like re the research that reparations have been done and some economists have done where they've traced back. Just like some economists in India have traced how much the British the Raj, yeah. took out from the Raj. And it's just, it's gone. It's totally gone. Uh, New York City built, was the major place for building purpose-built slave ships. Uh, it was the world leader in that, along with the British. And that that entire thing is just erased. It's it's all Puritan virtue there. You, know, you never you never know that they ever made a dime off of uh, and of course the Industrial Revolution and a lot of the abolitionists talk about the dignity of free labor. But you know, this it, it took seventy five years after the Civil War before they stopped machine gunning workers who were striking. But that was textile factories in New England in New York, they were weaving cotton that came from the slaves. Right. So all of this is, uh, we have- It's all there. It's in It's all in your mind. Well, we said once that the US should have been named the United States of Amnesia. And it's true. <laughs> yeah. so. um, I, I, on the same topic of, of the importance of historic sites, I'll just point out that since you mentioned the slave revolts, the largest slave revolts in, in American history happened in St. John Parish at what is a Woodland Plantation. Right. That site was open for, it's one of the most significant sites for African history in the United States. 
they closed after a year because they could not generate enough visitation. So, um, you know, how we value history and how we value these sites uh, is also really, really important. And uh, we, we struggle every day with trying to figure out how to remain relevant and also how to keep visitors coming in the door because we, we do believe fully in, in what we do and we want to continue doing it, but if we don't have visitors coming through the doors, it, it's just not gonna happen. Yeah, and you, you, this may sound vulgar, and we're not supposed to talk about money, but um, <laughs> bottom line is people are clamoring for these stories and saying, we want to hear these stories. They're important. <coughs> Tell them to us. They're trying to hold people accountable, finally. But if you're not going to put your money where your mouth is and support the sites that are doing the work, the work will vanish. It will not get done. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that's something we have to keep in mind because, unfortunately, the federal government is not doing what happens in other countries and, and funding this. So I, the kid, kid or, he's talking about the Kid Ori house. I mean, that's a big deal. Mm -hmm. and, and people just didn't come, so. And the impact is huge because Laura is not just, you know, a plantation, but it is um, a supporter of small businesses. Mm -hmm. So there are many people who said, like I do, Arlene's in the gift shop, but um, products made by local artisans, um, you know, all kinds of uh, businesses, bus companies, small tour companies, larger ones come through there and they're all supported by Laura. It's a huge network. And when Laura's gone, a big pillar in the tourism industry is gone. And I want to say I was inspired to start a tour company through my work at Laura. So how many people have come through there, been inspired, have gone back to their classrooms and uh, integrated these stories and this you know, information? Um, the impact cannot be measured. Uh, literally can't because we don't know how much Laura has influenced so many people uh, because they didn't write back or they didn't come back to say this is what I did. Um, and so, yes, I think uh, they have right. Well, I think Emily, Emily Lee, and uh, Carla have been so gracious to host us tonight. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you all very much for coming. Thank you. We're, we're easily findable through the Laura Foundation website. So. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.